Hello everyone. My name is Arielle Silverman and today I'm going to talk about disability wisdom, teaching inclusion and empowerment of people with disabilities. I wear a couple of different hats. Growing up totally blind in a reformed Jewish congregation, I have a lot of first-hand experiences you might find informative. I am also a disability research fellow at the University of Washington and just completed a doctorate in social psychology so I've done some research on the effects of disability training exercises. Today, I'm going to describe a new approach to disability education. From what I've seen, reformed Jewish schools, youth programs, and synagogues are very interested in teaching about disabilities, which is great. But traditionally, the teaching tends to focus a lot on sensitivity or awareness understanding the limitations of disability, and learning how to help people with disabilities. Many groups like to use disability simulations, where students deal with a temporary disability, to promote sensitivity. In this presentation, I'm going to suggest that instead of sensitivity, we want to instill wisdom. Stigma scholars use the term wise to refer to somebody who treats someone with a stigma, like a disability, as an ordinary human being. I argue that we want our youth and students to learn how to see people with disabilities as ordinary people first. The way to do that, however, is not to use disability simulations, since those can give misleading information. Instead, when we think about how to teach about disability, we must recognize that people with disabilities are the real experts who should be front and center in the curriculum. So first, let's think about the traditional kind of disability training, at least what I have often run across. People sometimes will call it disability awareness or disability sensitivity training. It's often focused on prompting compassion and empathy for the disabled. Along with learning about disabilities, learning some facts about disabilities, people are often encouraged to try to imagine what it's like to live with a disability. To do this, people might be blindfolded, have their arm or leg braced, or wear earplugs, and then try to do normal activities with this impairment. Often, the discussion at the end centers on how hard it is to have a disability and how to help disabled people we might run into. Of course, it's always nice to teach empathy and kindness, but when we look at the real problems people with disabilities often describe, what's needed is usually more respect, not more kindness. For example, people with visible disabilities often face blatant pity and over-enthusiastic help. I've heard lots of stories of times when unsolicited help actually caused someone to get hurt. People with disabilities are often stereotyped as dependent and helpless and treated with pity. So lessons that focus on the negatives of disability and the need for help can unintentionally increase stereotyping and pity and promote condescending help. I also want to talk a little bit more specifically about disability simulation exercises. To be clear, these are exercises where students experience an impairment for a short period of time. They might try to eat a meal while impaired in some way or walk around blindfolded with another student guiding them. While well-intended, I have a few concerns about this type of learning activity based on some research evidence and some conversations that I've had with other disabled people. So basically, when people simulate a disability, they experience the shock and challenge of first becoming disabled the first half hour or so of developing a brand new disability. It's extremely disorienting and frustrating in many cases. They also don't experience a lot of things like the long-term adjustments people make, and the ways that disability changes their sociocultural life. Many people with long-term disabilities say the hardest part isn't the disability itself, but the public's reaction to it and the lack of accessible buildings, transportation, and so on. These are things that a short simulation doesn't capture. After many years of disability, most people begin to find it part of their normal, and they aren't usually more frustrated or stressed overall than non-disabled people. So the simulation tends to exaggerate how hard the physical part of disability is, while at the same time underappreciating the sociocultural aspects of disability over time. 
And then finally, there's the distinction that in a simulation, somebody can escape a disability at any time. They can take off the blindfold or the leg brace at any time, but they cannot do so if they have a permanent disability. So because of all of this, there's concern that simulations could mislead people about the competencies of real people with disabilities and make people feel really distressed, which could work against the goal of inclusion and positive acceptance. So there's been some research on simulations that I'm going to talk about briefly. So there have been some studies that have shown that the simulation do help people feel more empathy toward the disabled, and that's good, but this can come at a price. So in some of my own dissertation studies, my colleagues and I had an experiment. We had college students attempt to navigate a hallway, pour water, and sort coins while blindfolded. Some of them were blindfolded, some of them weren't. And then we asked all of them to rate how well they thought blind people could do things like living on their own or being an elementary school teacher. Students who had been blindfolded right before they filled out the survey rated blind people's abilities lower than the students who had not been blindfolded. The blindfolded students also said that if they became blind, they thought it would take them longer to adjust and that they would adjust less well and end up being less capable if they became blind. In another study, college students simulated schizophrenia by listening to intrusive voices. Afterwards, they said that they would be less likely to talk to a person with schizophrenia, and they were more likely to think that people with schizophrenia should be institutionalized if they refuse treatment. Finally, in one of my colleagues' studies, um, after college students simulated multiple disabilities, vision loss, hearing loss, and a reading impairment, these students were in more negative moods. They were feeling really distressed. Um, and they also showed more stereotyping. So they rated people with disabilities in general as more dependent and incompetent. These are obviously not things that we want to happen. So the natural question is, how do we teach about disabilities without using simulations? Unfortunately, there's been less research on successful alternatives to simulations. But before I answer that question, I want to step back a bit and think about a different overall approach to teaching about disability. This approach is one that treats disability more like a cultural identity than an illness. So I propose that teaching about disability should be similar to how we might teach about race, sexual orientation, and other differences that we have. The sociologist Irving Goffman wrote about how certain individuals from a majority group can become wise with regard to stigmatized minorities. He borrowed the term wise from the gay subculture of the 1950s. So he wrote, wise persons are the marginal men for whom the individual with a fault need feel no shame nor exert self-control knowing that in spite of his failing, he will be seen as an ordinary other. He also wrote about how wise persons acknowledge the full humanity of people who have stigmas. So in other words, people without disabilities can become wise enough to treat the person with a disability as an ordinary other, deserving of the respect and dignity accorded to all human beings. I believe this is a good goal any disability curriculum should strive for. After all, one in seven human beings have a disability of some kind. So instead of just teaching our youth to be good helpers to the disabled, we should be teaching them to be open to working with, hiring, working for, befriending, dating, and marrying people with disabilities, engaging in all the sorts of human relationships with these people. So now let's break it down a little further. Here are three principles that I think any disability training should focus on. First treating the disabled person with full humanity. Second, treating the disabled person as an ordinary other. And third, treating the disabled person as an expert on their own needs. Before I explain these principles in more detail, I just want to contrast this approach with the traditional sensitivity approach that I described at the beginning of this webinar. The traditional curriculum emphasizes the challenges of disability but the WISE curriculum that I'm suggesting focuses on similarities and ordinary capabilities that disabled people have. The traditional curriculum teaches people how to help the disabled, but the WISE curriculum teaches people how to intermingle with the disabled as equals. And finally, traditional disability lessons are often directed by people without disabilities, what some scholars refer to as outsiders 
looking in and trying to understand the disability experience through simulations. Wise disability lessons, by contrast, are directed by insiders, people with disabilities themselves, who share their experiences with the students. The effect is that students learn from other people's long-term disability experiences what disability is really like, rather than trying to figure it out for themselves through a short simulation. So what should we teach in the WISE curriculum? We'll go principle by principle. So the first one is acknowledging the disabled person's full humanity. I think this is fairly straightforward, treating all people with respect. For example, one should ask permission before touching or grabbing any human being who's older than an infant, whether they have a disability or not. It amazes me how often people violate this simple rule. When interacting with disabled adults, treating them like adults, not referring to them by childish pet names like honey or baby or sweetheart, asking them direct questions instead of talking to their companions, what does he want, what does she want, those are all kind of basic tenets of acknowledging the person's full humanity. The second wise principle that I have identified is to treat the disabled person like an ordinary other. In practice, this means that in the vast majority of situations, we should treat people with disabilities exactly the same way that we would treat them if they did not have a disability. A disability usually affects only one or two aspects of a person's life. So when interacting with them, we can focus on the many aspects of their life that are unaffected. It also means that people with disabilities are not special, amazing, or inspirational heroes. In fact, many of my disabled friends and I laugh and cringe at the word special. Having a disability becomes very ordinary, and we get used to performing mundane tasks on a daily basis. It doesn't take me extra courage to walk my familiar route to work, for example, but people constantly approach me and tell me how inspiring and brave I must be to be able to walk to work every day. We should teach folks to see people with disabilities as ordinary equals, for this treatment is truly wise, and it will help build trusting, equal relationships between people with and without disabilities. And finally, the third principle. Sometimes questions come up about how to help or accommodate a person's disability. In fact, it's almost inevitable in any kind of long-lasting relationship, this question will come up at some point. In such situations, the person with the disability is the expert. People with disabilities spend years learning and refining their techniques for living in the world and getting things done. Each person is different and has different needs and preferences. The best way to help someone who has a disability is by simply asking if they need help and then listening attentively to what they request or what they don't request. And if an individual says that they can do a job or participate in an activity safely and competently, believe them. Again, this is a very simple principle, but it's amazing how often the knowledge of disabled people is ignored. Times when someone states that they can do a job or they can safely participate in some kind of activity, but they're turned away by skeptics. Or on the flip side, people with less visible disabilities who ask for assistance that they need and are denied because someone says they don't look disabled enough to receive that assistance. Their expertise and their knowledge of their own needs is ignored. So now let's talk about how we can teach disability wisdom without using simulations. Remember that disabled people are the experts on this subject and have the inside track on how to be wise. So they need to be the lead teachers. If you're planning a disability workshop, look around for local disability groups and find folks who might be willing to come in and talk to your group about their disability and their life. Most of us will do it for free. If you have a college or university near you, see if they have a disability support services office and call them to ask if there are disabled students who might want to talk to your group. When I talk to groups, I show them the assistive technology I use, but I also talk a lot about the typical things I enjoy doing. When students ask me questions, they usually ask about my ordinariness, what things I like to do or did when I was a kid. When I talk to kids groups, I often get asked questions about the sports that I played and the games that I played when I was a kid. When I talk to college students, I often get asked questions about what I like to do on the weekends, for example, and I always answer those questions as honestly as I can and as completely as I can. 
they don't necessarily want to know that much about what's different about me. They want to know what's similar about me, how I'm similar to them. Disabled guest speakers can discuss the ordinariness of their lives. They can also share a bit of disability culture and talk about the social issues facing their disability community and sensitize students to those particular issues. So whenever I talk to special education students, I always discuss the fact that many blind kids aren't being taught Braille these days due to limited resources and a push toward audio and print media for low vision readers. The expert-led discussion need not stop at one visit. Perhaps you could pair students in your group with disabled pen pals, even folks living across the country for letter exchanges, email or phone exchanges. Or if it's feasible in your area, you could pair students with folks who have disabilities and let them do ordinary activities together like going to see a movie, dining out, or playing a sport, whether adapted or not, depending on the disability involved. One-on-one -on -one contact is the best way to dispel stereotypes and help people see minority group members as equals. Some of you may be thinking, guest speakers are so boring. How do I keep the kids engaged and interested without relying on a disability simulation? Well, that's a good question. There are ways to set up hands-on activities that still extend from disabled people's insider knowledge and that avoid the pitfalls of simulations. For example, you could blindfold students and then have a blind presenter come in and teach them how to recognize a few braille letters by touch. Or have somebody teach the students a few signs in American Sign Language or how to use a head-operated device or voice recognition to type without use of their hands. These are just a couple of examples. Another activity could be for students and disabled athletes to play adapted sports together, like goalball or wheelchair racing. While these things might look a little bit like simulation, the key difference is that the students are experiencing successful adjustment to disability, rather than being thrown into the shock and fear of new disability. This approach also teaches students to trust disabled people's insider expertise. So as I conclude this webinar, here are a few points to take away. I think we can all agree that it's important to teach folks about disabilities and that this learning continues throughout life. If we really want to be sensitive to the needs and desires that people with disabilities have articulated, though, then our lessons need to focus on wisdom rather than mere sensitivity. We need to teach folks to feel comfortable intermingling with people with disabilities in all walks of life and on an equal playing field. Such lessons should emphasize the disabled person's ordinariness and full humanity, and the information is most accurate when it comes from the inside out, from the experts who live with disabilities every day and are enmeshed in disability culture. Disability simulations, while appealing on the surface, can unwittingly focus too much attention on the deficits and the differences that accompany disability. Instead, I suggest bringing people with disabilities and non-disabled students together to join in fun, imaginative activities that highlight the capacities of all human beings. I'm happy to consult with any of you who are planning disability teachings. My contact information is on the last slide, so feel free to be in touch. Thank you for listening today.